Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. Today it's time for another one of those things that I didn't know that I needed and now can't live without. A secure home network router like this Protect Leave Vault. And the odds are that you're going to want one too, but why? Well, I know a guy who is as security conscious as he is wealthy, and he doesn't take very many chances. His yard, which is inside a gated community, features extensive intruder detection and surveillance systems. He arms his monitored alarm at night, which includes all of the windows and downstairs motion areas. He sleeps next to a biometric gun vault, and while he sleeps, his most valuable assets, like his bank account information, are protected by pretty much whatever modem the cable company could get cheap in bulk when he signed up with them six years ago. And I've got a dollar that says he never changed the default admin password on it either. Now, I think the disparity between his physical security and his digital security are a result of him not even thinking about or even being aware of just how easily his homeland can be breached. I mean, if he realized that he was leaving a screen door open at night, he'd immediately fix that. But it's even worse than that, because on the internet, everybody is local, which means that screen door could open right into North Korea or Belarus. It'd be like a scary version of Narnia, where Aslan wants your session keys so he can transcend two-factor authentication and become one with your data. Now, it's entirely possible, given the right hardware from your internet service provider, that you can set up a secure LAN by following some best practices, most of which we will cover today. But I'm a bit of a gambling man, and I figure if somebody's going to hack an internet gateway, they're going to do it to the models that the ISPs provide to their users, because there are millions upon millions of them out there in the wild. It's the same reason the viruses target Windows more often than Mac. It's all about attack service multiplied by the number of instances out there to attack. It's like the inverse of a zebra's camouflage, a case where for once you want to be different from the crowd for your own safety. The reality is that for DSL, cable, or fiber, you're going to have to have the box that the internet company gave you pretty much no matter what, but it doesn't need to be and likely should not be your only one layer of protection. We'll take a look at both a cheap homebrew solution based on the Elite Mini PC and then a turnkey vault system from Protectly. Before we start writing any checks, is there anything we should do to secure our existing home router? The answer is yes, and that's true whether you're going to add to it or not. Before we go too far down the rabbit hole, let's make sure that everybody knows what I'm talking about when I say a router. A router connects different networks together, managing traffic between them and directing packets to their correct destinations across networks. A switch just connects devices within the same network, facilitating communication and data sharing among them by using the MAC addresses to forward data to the correct device. So the box that connects all your PCs together in your house is the switch, and the box that allows the packets to go to and from the internet is the router. Now some units, like the Unify UDM Pro, can serve both purposes. And most cable, DSL, and fiber modems serve two purposes. First, they bridge the two physically different networks, like from coax to ethernet, and then they route traffic between them. And if it has multiple ports, it's a bridge, switch, and a router, and a modem, all in one. So it can get a bit confusing because so many devices can do more than one simple function. And as you'll see, we're going to delegate responsibility for some individual functions much more precisely. We'll start with the $0 approach of just securing what you already have. You may never have thought about it as more than just a beige or black box that the cable company leaves behind when you get to your internet, but it serves a very important purpose. Besides physically connecting you to their copper or fiber network, it's also the firewall, the DHCP server, and the gateway that keeps the bad guys from wandering around your home digitally without being invited. There are a couple of ways that we can help secure a typical ISP router. First, you need to know its IP address, and there are a number of ways to get it. In the easiest case, the username, the password, and the IP address will be printed on a label on the side of the unit. If that's not the case, you can check your default gateway in your PC or Mac's network settings, and that will most likely point to your router. Failing that, you can try common addresses like 192.168.1.0 and hopefully land on it with a good guess. Once you know the IP, simply enter it into your browser's address bar, and if you're having a good day, the router's local webpage will load and you can log into the router. The username and password might again have been printed on a label on the side. In some cases, they use the MAC address, either in whole or in part, as the password. But in some older cases, the security was largely non-existent. On the venerable old WRT54G, perhaps my most beloved old router, the default username was blank and the password was admin. On every single one of them. Now, in that router's defense, I'm pretty sure that remote administration was turned off by default, but even so, it's hardly a good idea to keep the well-known default admin password. 
If it's an option in your router, I also recommend that you rename the admin account, and ideally not to something obvious like Dave. Having an unexpected username is almost like having two layers of passwords, at least as long as it can't be trivially guessed. Once you get the credential issues squared away, here are the top 10 things you should do with your ISP-provided router to ensure it's connecting and protecting you as best it can. First, update the router's firmware. A lot of people update Windows at least weekly, but have firmware on their router that's years out of date. Manufacturers release firmware updates to address vulnerabilities, add performance, add features, and so on. Regularly check and update your router's firmware to ensure that it has the latest security patches. You'll likely have better luck searching by its model number, but there are always a chance that your router is running some custom firmware or a configuration from your ISP that would be lost if you reflashed it. But in that case, they've almost certainly locked it down so that you can't monkey with it. You don't want to break your router, however, so if in doubt, check with your ISP first to see if it's okay to update it. Number two, disable remote management. Turn off remote access to your router's admin interface to prevent unauthorized access from the internet. This setting should only be enabled if absolutely necessary, which would be weird, and with strong passwords and with encryption. I once enabled mine and got bored and started tinkering with it from a cruise ship. I kicked off a firmware update on the router, perhaps the worst thing you could possibly do remotely, and then of course I was locked out of my system for the rest of the trip. So if you can, avoid even having it enabled, as it's like root access to your network. Number three, enable WPA3 encryption. If your router supports it, use WPA3 encryption for your Wi-Fi network. If WPA3 is not available, use WPA2 AES. Avoid using WEP or WPA slash WPA2 with TKIP as they're outdated and vulnerable. Number four, use a strong Wi-Fi password. Create a strong, unique password for your Wi-Fi network. Avoid using easily guessable information like English words and names in your pets and the street you grew up on, and consider using a passphrase or a combination of letters, numbers, and special characters. It really does matter with today's computational horsepower because English words are just too simply vulnerable to a dictionary attack, even when combined with numbers. Number five, disable WPS or Wi-Fi protected setup. WPS is well known for its security vulnerabilities. Disabling this feature protects you against brute force attacks that exploit WPS to gain access to your Wi-Fi network. Number six, create a guest network. If your router supports it, create a separate guest network for visitors. This isolates guest devices from your main home network and its connected devices, reducing the risk of unauthorized access to your personal data. Now, it still provides internet access to your guests, but they can't see, for example, your desktop or your MacBook that are connected to the LAN. They can only see the internet which is probably what you wanted all along. Number seven, disable UPnP or universal plug and play. UPnP can make your network more susceptible to attacks by automatically opening ports. Disable UPnP unless you have a specific need for it and fully understand the risks. Number eight, monitor your connected devices. Regularly check the list of devices connected to your network. Unrecognized devices could indicate unauthorized access. And in the least case, there shouldn't be a Samsung phone on your host network if everybody in your house has iPhones, that kind of thing. Number nine, you can also limit your number of DHCP leases to a reasonable number as a precaution, and that way you won't become a hotspot for public Wi-Fi in your area. And finally, number 10, enable the firewall features. Ensure your router's built-in firewall is enabled. Additionally, configure any available security settings such as SPI or Stateful Packet Inspection to further secure your network from unwanted traffic and attacks. And once you've done all that, your next step would be a secure router to protect your LAN from any attacks that do make it through your ISP. So if you wisely decide to add a home network router dedicated to protecting your LAN, there are a couple of ways to do it. I'll tell you the three that I've tried, but it doesn't mean that these are the only ways you could go about it. Each of these scenarios require that you purchase or build a router that has at least two ports, one for input and one for output, and ideally another LAN port for local management. It might be a Dream Machine Pro from Unify, or a simple custom setup on a little mini desktop like the Elite Mini PC, or even a more advanced dedicated unit like the 10-core Vault from Protectly. Before you decide on what your hardware needs are, though, let's figure out where it will live as that impacts what you need to buy. Option one requires that you put your ISP router into what's known as bridge mode, so it's no longer the router at all. Whatever you plug into it gets to drink direct from the fire hose of the internet, as it just bridges the ISP's network to your LAN, and if you did nothing else, every Ethernet port in your home would be a live jack to the raw internet. 
That's clearly not what we want. So once we've got the ISP box in bridge mode, we can install our new, more advanced router behind it. And as far as our new router knows, it's directly connected to the internet. Option two is to run double NAT or network address translation, which means your router is a router behind an existing router, two levels deep. It's an extra layer of inconvenience for intruders, but it can mess with port forwarding and other networking features, so I don't actually recommend this approach. If for some reason you cannot bridge your ISP router though, this might be your only option. It's an extra layer of inefficiency in theory, but when I tested it, I didn't see a measurable difference in ping times, at least not a full millisecond's worth. So the first option is precisely what I've done for the last several years, both on cable before and on fiber optic now. I put my ISP's router into bridge mode and then let a UDM Pro handle all the work of being the firewall, doing security, assigning DHCP addresses, and so on. It's all worked perfectly for a few years now, and I'm pretty much a Ubiquiti fanboy at this point. And this is not a sponsored episode by anybody. Recently, however, I upgraded my internet service to symmetric 5 gigabit fiber, as I detailed in an episode that you can also find on this channel. I discovered that with the major security features turned on in the UDM Pro, it could only process about 2.5 gigabits of traffic, so I was only getting half of my available bandwidth. Now, I get that 2.5 gigabits is plenty of bandwidth, and there's no real scenario where I make use of much more than that anyway, but I'm paying for more, and so I felt morally compelled to eventually see my 5 gigabits in speed test results, if nothing else. And I found out that if I turned off IDS and IPS, it could do all 5 gigabits, but not with them turned on. But what the heck are IDS and IPS? Well, intrusion detection systems and intrusion prevention systems, better known as IDS and IPS, are critical components of modern network security. They are often implemented in the router to protect networks from malicious activities and threats. These two systems work together to detect, analyze, and respond to potential threats before they can cause harm. Let's break down how each system works and their core concepts. First, we have the intrusion detection system. There are three key aspects to IDS, which are the detection, analysis, and alerting. IDS monitors network traffic and system activities for malicious actions or policy violations. It's like a surveillance system that watches for signs of possible attacks, intrusions, or anomalies. The detection is based on various methodologies, including signature-based detection, which identifies known patterns of malicious activities, anomaly-based detection, which detects deviations from normal behavior, and stateful protocol analysis, which examines network communication protocols to identify suspicious activities. Once potential threats are detected, IDS analyzes them to determine their nature and potential impact. This analysis can involve comparing the detected activity against a database of known threats, like signatures, or assessing the deviation from baseline behaviors to identify unknown threats. Upon detection and analysis, IDS generates alerts to notify the administrator of suspicious activities. These alerts can vary in severity depending on the potential impact. IDS provides detailed information about the intrusion attempt, including the source, the target, the time, and the type of attack, enabling administrators to take whatever action they feel is appropriate. Now, these alerts won't do you much good if they just live in some log file that you never look at, so either you should have it email you the alerts or you need to be proactive about checking your logs. Next, we have Intrusion Prevention Systems, or IPS. IPS can also be broken down into three core aspects, prevention, enforcement, and mitigation. IPS actually extends the functionality of IDS by not only detecting the threats, but also taking some predefined actions to prevent them from succeeding in the first place. It's positioned in line with network traffic, allowing it to actively block or mitigate threats in real time before they reach the target. That's the prevention part. IPS can also enforce security policies, ensuring that all network traffic complies with the established rules and standards. For example, it can block traffic from malicious known IP addresses or prohibit certain types of network requests, like Tor. You'd sign up for a service that keeps your lists up to date, and the rest should be automatic. In addition to blocking attacks, IPS can also perform mitigating actions such as closing connections, reconfiguring network devices, or modifying malicious content in transit to neutralize the threat. It works closely with other network security components like firewalls to provide a comprehensive defense mechanism. Quality modern routers often integrate IDS and IPS functionalities to offer enhanced network security. This integration allows routers to monitor incoming and outgoing traffic for signs of intrusion. It also allows them to analyze data packets in real time to detect anomalies or known attack patterns and to take immediate action to block or mitigate threats before they penetrate deeper into your network. 
The key things to remember are that IDS detects and alerts on potential threats while IPS takes action to prevent those threats from causing any harm. Now, if IDS and IPS sound interesting, you need software to provide those services, and the two most common choices are PFSense and OPNSense, the latter of which is actually a fork of the former. Since I prefer its UI and find it a bit easier to use, I opted to go with OPNSense. Now, just getting to this point has likely taken 15 minutes, and so I can't do a full tutorial on setting up and configuring OPNSense. That will have to wait for another day. For now, we'll treat OPNSense like a black box piece of software that we install with the defaults, and I'll leave a link to a Techno Tim video in the description with more information on setting up, tweaking, and even virtualizing a full firewall. The easiest way to set up OPNSense is to grab a small form factor PC, something with at least two Ethernet ports, and ideally three. This elite mini desktop PC fits the bill nicely for anything up to a gigabit as it features dual NICs on board, a Raptor Lake i5 CPU, up to 64 gigabytes of RAM and up to 4 terabytes of storage, as well as 4K and 8K monitor support and even a USB-C 4.0 port. To get it up and running, I simply booted off a USB stick loaded with the OPN Sense installation image, walked through the installer, and I was up and running. That placed me in a dual NAT setup, however, as I was still using my Ubiquiti UDM Pro as my gateway, but the UDM Pro lived behind the ISP router and the OPN Sense router. That means OPNSense doesn't need to act as a DHCP server and gateway. In my case, since I have 5 gigabit Ethernet, I needed something with higher performance, and so I opted to go with a 6-port vault from Protectly. It features an Intel Core i7 and 10 cores and 12 threads, up to 64 gigabytes, 4 terabyte SSD, and so on. But most important, it features dual 10 gigabit SFB Plus ports. I put RJ45 transceivers in those ports and plugged the vault in between the ISP modem and the UDM Pro. Once I install OPNSense on the vault, I configure it to be a transparent gateway. That means that rather than being a router, it acts like a bridge passing everything, subject to the firewall rules and IDS and IPS, directly from the ISP onto the UDM Pro. Once I had enabled IDS and IPS on the vault, I turned them off on the UDM Pro where they had constituted a significant performance bottleneck. But with them running on the 10 core i7 with a peak turbo speed of 4.7 gigahertz, I was able to achieve full bandwidth quite easily. Once you have your OPN Sense router up and running, the maintenance is very low. You'll want to keep it up to date by turning on automatic updates, or at least by checking for updates manually quite often. I also turned on the ClamAV antivirus service on the vault, and so it updates its virus signatures on a schedule every night as well. At this point, we've secured your ISP router as best we can and introduced another layer of protection in the form of OPN Sense. If you're interested in learning more about deploying and configuring OPN Sense itself, let me know in the video comments. I wasn't sure if there was any appetite for a low-level walkthrough of the setup, and so I kept today's overview pretty high level. If you found any of today's episode to be interesting or entertaining, remember that I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so please be sure to leave me one of each before you go today. And if you're already a subscriber, thank you. Please consider turning on all notifications for the channel so you don't miss an episode. If once a week turns out to be too often, you can always turn it back off. If you or someone you know is on the autism spectrum, check out the free sample of my book on Amazon. It's everything I know about living your best life on the autism spectrum. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time right here in Dave's Garage.